Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, as you can see, the slides will talk about this uh, pathogen cross toxic pathogen interaction. Well, so before I go into that, probably I would uh, like Samdatta asked us so to talk about a little bit about uh, like my background. Is so I am uh, by training I'm a mathematician. So like. Uh, in pure mathematics, I say, after that I moved to working on applied mathematical problem, as you see here, this dynamical system theory, game theory, and kind of thing. And I did my PhD from University of Calcutta, and after that I was in uh, her lab in Hyderabad for uh, two years, and then we, I moved to uh, in Canada for postdocs, where I learned basically uh, the, the infectious disease part, and mostly to apply the game theoretical techniques and other techniques, how we can apply in studying uh, infectious disease. After that, I was in University of Utah and it, uh, worked on several different things and uh, was Penn State for a couple of years and then moved and here and joined uh, SNU Shivnathar University. So the last two years, uh, I was in, uh, uh, in my mathematics department and teaching and doing research on infectious disease problems, several problems, antibiotic drug resistance, human behavior, all are related in a wide aspects of infectious disease. Okay, so um, feel free to ask questions and also I'll be here till Sunday, so just uh, hang on and discuss several things and we are also doing for dinner, lunch and things, so I don't mind to, you know, talk uh, with students. Okay, so let's start. So we'll talk about uh, uh, the story of cross among pathogens and its importance in disease epidemiology. Okay, we'll talk about uh, some of the mechanism of pathogen interaction. As you see that pathogen, they interact with other, uh, interact with other. And we'll talk about the models of several mechanistic model to uh, this uh, pathogen interaction. And we'll see the dynamical uh, implication essentially uh, like how these interactions among pathogens shapes the dynamical pattern of the disease outbreak okay so uh, i know we all are tired so what i'll do i'm not going to the very uh, detail of the result how you obtained all these things but rather will give an overview of several disease interactions. We'll see instances like where we can apply, how we can uh, get to know about this, okay? Uh, well, so, uh, fine. So, what we know that the infectious disease is an outcome of, uh, it's, it's understood an outcome of integrated relationship between host uh, immune response and the particular pathogen that cause the disease and the environmental factor, including clinical uh, management. Okay, so this is the inter uh, interaction of all those three basically determines the health impact of the, um, of the individual host here. So traditionally, uh, each disease or assumed a distinct entity that existed in the nature and it is independent of the biosocial context. So the biomedical and public health strategy was to diagnostically isolate and separate or treat each infectious disease as a separate case, even if there are multiple diseases co-occur in a community in the same geographical region and over reasonably over the same time period. But this kind of the concept has been changing because recently there is a growing attention due to evolutionary history of the species and comorbidity that in the health, that is a presence of more than one uh, symptoms of one disease in the in individual at the same time. So that this concept is changing. So Meryl Singer in 90s, who is an American anthropologist, he actually introduced the term of syndemic, okay? Or the synergistic epidemic, which is the aggregation of two or more uh, the, the uh, concurrent and sequential epidemics or disease cluster in the population with biological inter interactions, and that exhibit the prognosis and the burden of disease. And there are three major concepts that underlies this uh, syndemic approach, which is disease concentration or the disease clusters and disease interaction and the social factors, that large scale social forces give rise to them. 
which is uh, the concept centers around essentially to identify these multiple uh, epidemics that co-occur in the particular temporal and geographical context and to understand how these uh, multiple epidemics that interact both population and individual level under the large social forces, for example, these economic conditions, demographic conditions, and social conditions. Okay? And to understand this interaction, the disease, any question? Okay. In the disease, we need an integrated approach of modeling that a multi level model that can bridge like different study at the same time. For example, the ecological design, the ecological studies, that on, on also epidemiological observation under the large social factors to understand this. Okay, so this study of pathogen-pathogen interaction is a part of that, and this is a new emerging area of the research in the disease epidemiology to understand the community health and uh, social care. Okay, so uh, what I'll do, I'll talk about this pathogen-pathogen interaction. You understand this is an important thing, so you'll see in the next few slides. And uh, I'll we'll see that how different kind of interactions, pathogen interactions, can shape this outbreak pattern here. Okay, so um, disease interaction is a common phenomena when more than one pathogen co-circulate in the community. And there are two different ways this is interaction happens. One is the direct interaction when pathogen directly interfere with each other via host immune system. Okay, what you see in this uh, uh, this uh, uh, schematic. And there is another one which is indirect, like the disease transmission of one pathogen had some causal influence on the transmission of the other pathogen. So, and it is due to some third parties. So, we'll see different kind of interactions here. So, it is not possible though to distinguish a disease interaction to fall in either immunological or ecological. There is always overlap exist. But here is some of the list. For example, immunological interactions that the interaction occurs through host immunity system. For example, cross immunity which is very seen in different influenza strains and also antibody dependent enhancement We'll describe a little bit. And also, it could happen through regulation of some immune component of the host. For example, immune suppression and cytokine-based things, which what is seen in HIV and TB or HIV and malaria. And there are also different interactions that is more indirect or ecological interactions. For example, disease-induced mortality. Now, how it happens? So when, by infection, the individual develops severe disease, they are taken out from the chain of the circulation, or it is through the vaccination, okay? You are taken out from the chain of circulation from this host, and that way it interferes with the other pathogen. So that is the isolation, vaccination, or even host heterogeneity, or different immune profile can uh, induce different ecological interactions. So here I'm going to talk about this cross immunity and antibody dependent enhancement, and also like we'll talk about this isolation. So I'll give you the overall view of this couple of things and uh, the results. See. And this is a mix of my own work and also other work here. Okay. Now, uh, so first is okay. So here is kind of the split I have done uh, for my total talk here. So I'll talk about the model and the dynamics of interaction. We'll talk about uh, different kind of mechanism of the interaction and the model of it. We'll see how. This gives the shape of this uh, dynamics, and also we'll see in the next step is how we can use interaction mechanism to infer the dynamical pattern of certain disease. And in the third category, sort of uh, inverse problem that okay, fine, we understand this is the mechanism, this is the dynamical pattern it shows. If you change your parameter, that's fine. But given the data, can you identify what kind of mechanism is going uh, in that? So the third problem actually focus on this one. So these are the three things that uh, uh, I'm going to talk here. Okay. So the first one. Okay. The before that, uh, let me talk a little bit about the SIR model. We all know. I'm not going into the detail. But what you know is that the SIR is the classic but old kind of the framework where we can, uh, which can describe the disease process on more uh, average uh, or mean field approximation way. And the, uh, the R0 here, by the time you all know that, this is one of the key 
index which can cause the disease progress in the community. For example, R0 greater than 1 means uh, there will be an epidemic, which is very clear from here, the second equation, as you see here, or R0 less than 1 means this epidemic will die out. Now, this we all know. And when we add, so there is no birth and death in this disease process, as you see here. There are few susceptible here in the population that gets the disease and infected, and over time they recover. Now, when you add birth and death in this process, what you see here, yes, so it is model with birth and death, and we see here that this become an endemic disease, this disease persists, and the important thing is that you see there is some recurrent outbreaks in the beginning. So there are some recurrent outbreaks in the beginning followed by uh, uh, endemicity of the disease when you, there is a birth and death. Now, most of these epidemics, what you see here, like influenza, measles, are seasonal. Like in winter, we have more, there's a high uh, research of, in the transmission, summer it is low. So seasonality is there. So when we add this seasonal forcing with this thing, what we see here is that when this natural, so there is a natural period of this recurrent outbreak. And when this natural period is the integer multiple of the seasonal forcing, then we see several resonant peaks, which is sustained in the system. Okay? And depending on your, this amplitude of seasonal forcing, which is the seasonal forcing here, this alpha double zero is the amplitude, you will say the different period of outbreaks we can see here. Like when it is low, there is a two-year period outbreak, and when it is high, there is a uh, there is a annual outbreak. So this is fine, but this is one disease under death and uh, birth and death and seasonal disease, and you will see this kind of outbreaks. Now this pattern, the simple pattern of two years or annual outbreak, can get disrupted when there is multiple disease and they interact through cross immunity. Okay, so. Yes, that is what you see here, sinusoidal. Sorry? This coefficient. What do you mean by the coefficient? Which coefficient? Alpha zero. Alpha zero. So this alpha zero is the, this is uh, the transmission and this is the amplitude of this. This is the seasonal forcing. So every year you see this one is the like sine curve. So transmission, there's a force during the winter. This way it is set up so that in every winter, in this winter month, there's a high surge in the transmission. After that, when it summer comes, it goes down. Again, next winter, it is up. So there is a seasonal forcing always in every year in the winter in the transmission. And that makes this kind of curve. When there is a low, you can see two year periodic, and when it is uh, high, then you see the annual outbreak. And that also happens because there's a natural period of the system, and that you can calculate by the eigenvalues of the system at this steady state. It is possible to calculate the, what is the natural period. This depends on the parameter values. What are the parameter values you have taken of the system, is here model. Okay? So now, when there is another pathogen there circulating in the system, and the, both of them interact through cross immunity. So here is the cross immunity model, which is the extension of the SR model. It's a two disease model, right? What you see here, don't go through all these uh, uh, equations. Uh, it's difficult now. But what you see here in the schematic, there is a susceptible population here. The, uh, infection by pathogen 1, so individual moves to I1, and by pathogen P2, they moves to I2, and over time, they recover. So this R1 and R2. And they develop immunity from this earlier infection. So J1 and J2, what you see here, this is where the individual get the secondary infection, the infection by the other pathogen. So what you see here, this is R1, that is recovered from pathogen 1, and J2 is the infected by pathogen P2. Okay? And over time, they get recovered, and they're immune to both of these pathogens. Okay, so here is the parameter, this epsilon 2 and epsilon 1, what you see here in this uh, expression as well. These actually determine the strength of cross immunity. Now again, I'm telling you, this cross immunity is a within individual, is a within individual process. Okay, that is happening in the individual. That is a within host process that we are going to, scaling up in the population level. That is the art of modeling. 
Okay, so here we are taking this thing here in the population level. So this is a population level model. Okay, so that is what we, what we get, and the model is also seasonally forced. So what we see here in this proximity, when different values of this strength of proximity we take, we see this kind of dynamics. For example, there is a waning rate, of course. Like after individual get uh, immunity from the disease, it also wanes over time. For example, influenza, even measles also. Earlier it was thought that measles is lifelong immunity. Now it is like over 30 years or 40 years, and antibody decays in the individual. Okay. Uh, so what you see here, if the winning is a one year, you see this kind of bifurcation we see if we vary the cross immunity. Okay. And if we take winning two years we get different multi-periodicity circles here in the system. And this also seen if we vary the seasonality. So proper amount of this, uh, the, the degree of cross immunity and the seasonality can give rise to different multi-annual cycles in the system. So that is the dynamical pattern. That interaction can give rise to different periodic uh, uh, outbreak of these two diseases, okay? Uh, and okay, fine. There are some some kind of time series. We see that at this point, you see this is I think six years or something like that. So this kind of dynamics, the red one and black one, the two different pathogen. What you see here. Okay. Now there in the earlier, you see the two disease has same the symmetric cross immunity. They put on one the same order of magnitude, uh, uh, the, the strength of cross immunity. If we make it asymmetric, not that two different pathogens will, uh, uh, will, will give the same cross protection. Okay? So here is, if we vary this two different way, you see in this that more complicated dynamics we see. For example, the A is the periodicity, different order cycle we can get depending on this epsilon R and epsilon, epsilon P and epsilon R. And the second, the figure B is the phase difference, okay? Like two outbreak, there's a phase difference of weeks. For example, I can give you a quick uh, idea. So here is, uh, you see that outbreak of one disease, one outbreak, and another one, say, for example, here. So this is kind of phase, there's some way of measuring this thing, but this is, you can say this is the phase difference of this outbreak to our pattern over several weeks. And also there is a, a, a variability in the maximum peak size and minimum peak size if we change this asymmetric cross immunity. So what we saw here is that this cross immunity, a kind of disease interactions uh, through host immunity process can give rise to variable dynamics if we change the magnitude of the signal variation in transmission or also the degree uh, of the cross immunity. So this is, one of this, uh, the mechanism of interaction where transmission of one pathogen can inhibit, okay, reduce the chance of getting infection by the other pathogen, okay. There are other interactions when if you get infection one pathogen, it can actually increase the risk of higher risk for the other pathogen, so which is called AD, antibody dependent enhancement, this kind of interaction, it can be seen in dengue viral infection. Okay, we all know that. I hope this is mine. Okay, so dengue is a, is a common infection in um, a trop, tropical region in Southeast Asia, we know. And when person get infected when dengue virus, uh, mosquito bites, uh, infected mosquito bites this person, and this dengue virus infects the lag, Langerhans cells, it is a kind of dendritic cell in the skin, and after that, these infected cells travel to the lymph nodes, and this way it spreads to the all, all over the body. Okay, and that increases the high level of uh, virus in the bloodstream, which is called uh, viremia. Okay, and that uh, we, this time we can say that individual is infected, uh, has very, very high vital load. Now, for ADE, this antibiotic dependent, okay, so here is a couple of outbreaks here in, uh, where it is, this is in Thailand, it is in Thailand from 1973 to 1999, and there's another outbreak is uh, in Vietnam from 1904 to 2007. So what you see here, the blue bars is the annual disease incidence, 
okay and uh, these four different color what is three different colors the red blue uh, green and yellow these are the four different serotypes so, so four different serotypes are prevalent in this southeast asia and different region it is the proportion is different okay so what we see is very clear two things from these two data, two sets of data. The first one is that the, this is the monthly data, this in the lower panel. And from this data, we can say this is very strongly, it is a seasonal. And one thing often happens in, uh, in, in dengue is the serotype replacement. You see, for example, here in the red, the red one is the dominant, for example, uh, 2004 to 2006. So every, every two and three years, you will see this some one dominant is one strain is dominant, and uh, next two three years someone is other. So this type of uh, uh, serotype replacement and this stereotype diverse, uh, diversity is uh, can be seen in dengue virus. So there are several scientists, group of scientists. Uh, propose several models to explain this, uh, wh why this kind of uh, diversity is seen and how we can explain. So I'm going to talk about, um, uh, okay, this uh, uh, model by uh, university, uh, I think Imperial College London, yeah. Uh, there's a group, they propose some model. So before that, we talk about this antibody dependent enhancement, what it happens basically. So this was first observed in, uh, in 19, uh, 60s by Dr. Scott in Vietnam. And what they have uh, noticed is that people who had earlier exposure to dengue, basically they have an increased risk of severe dengue compared to those who have no primary exposure of this dengue infection. So they actually uh, went further and there that this is kind of mechanism, cellular mechanism happening in the individual host that increase the higher risk of secondary dengue infection, which is called this antibody dependent enhancement. So it occurs when pre-existing antibody are present in the body from this primary infection. And when it, it uh, when this secondary infection, the virus comes here, uh, this, this blue here is uh, this antibodies here. They bind the virus and instead of what antibodies does basically from the memory when it comes, it actually neutralizes the virus. Okay, but instead of neutralizing it, they, they actually define some complex virus antibody complex, and that actually goes to the receptor of this monocyte. So this helping virus to bind with this cell instead of neutralizing it. And that increase the overall replication rate of the virus and increase the higher risk of secondary viral infection. So it is it enhancing the, uh, the, the infection rate for the secondary uh, uh, infection for this dengue. So this is kind of cellular mechanism, again, by model, uh, by uh, this Ricard et al. Okay, so here they have modeled four different serotypes, okay? And uh, four different serotypes. As you see here, this is the susceptible, and Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4 are four different serotypes. These are the recovery, and this is the secondary infection here. And this process, cellular process, again, this is AD is the cellular process, is scaled to the population level by these two parameters here in the force of infection, which is enhancement of susceptibility, like who has the secondary infection, they're more susceptible, you know, this uh, for secondary infection, okay? And they can also have higher transmission rate. Once they get secondary infection, they can also uh, increase, uh, transmit the infection more rapidly. So that is what uh, they have uh, introduced, these two parameters. So using these two parameters and with this simple uh, model, they have seen what is the effect of AD, antibody dependent enhancement on this uh, system, on all, all these four serotypes here. Okay, so here is the effect of AD. And you see there are four figures basically. The first figure, they have looked at the synchronization pattern. And there are three things you'll see, four, three different colors here, red, blue, and green. So the blue is basically desynchronized. So here, let me explain you. By desynchronized means they have run this thing simulation for 1,000 years, for example, okay? And when there are two outbreaks, you'll see the first, okay, let me tell you again. The first block here in the first uh, uh, figure is this between one and two serotypes. 
and second one is one and three, third one is two and three, fourth one is uh, three and four. So the two, uh, they have considered different combination of serotype and see how this synchronization. So in thousand years, when you have see the two different serotypes have in most of the time like synchronized in this time period, then they it is say it is okay. Sorry, I. This is a complete synchronization. This is the blue, uh, red one. Okay, desynchronized means is if this is your red, here is your blue. In all over the thousand pe uh, years of the period, and partial synchronization means, for example, in thousand years, maybe in the hundred years they synchronize. Okay, at the same time the outbreak happens at least 100 years, then we'll say this is a partial synchronization. So that is sort of definition here in this figure. And we'll see that this most of the cases, uh, we'll see this blue, we can see the band here, and this is desynchronized, that to different time this outbreak happens. And that is what it is, that in particular time, some particular serotype is prevalent, okay? That is what we see in the data. So AD can explain to some extent. The second one is the serotype dominance, like at least zero is the two types dominant in the blue, and the red one is basically the one serotype is uh, dominant here. And also, he, they have looked at interepidemic period. For example, like if there are blue outbreak happens, what is the interepidemic uh, period per se? So there are different way of this is kind of loosely I can speak like this, but the different way one can calculate this interepidemic period, periodicity, all these things. So I'm not going into the detail. But overall, you can say this AD can introduce different kind of dynamical pattern in the four different serotypes and this, uh, uh, this annual incidence. Not only this, they have, hmm. So here, for example, if you see that, okay, let me see, that this red one, so again, this is not my work, but still I can try to tell you, this blue one, basically this two serotype, you say the serotype dominance and zero is at least two serotypes are dominant there. Yeah, I understood your point. There are two, four different serotypes here, so it is not very clear. I think there are other pictures. I'm trying to say here that uh, ED can bring this kind of uh, feature here. So there are other pictures in this, uh, 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 like in this, their work. Okay. So uh, serotype persistence also they have checked, like for example, when there is the incidence for any serotype, it is above this 10 to the power 8 threshold level, then they say that their serotype is per, uh, persist in this system. So this also checked by for different transmissibility enhancement and different susceptibility enhancement. So not only that, they have also looked at that how serotype diversity actually influence, okay, the uh, incidence. Uh, so that is why they have considered the Shannon index of biodiversity and uh, also checked at the correlation. So HT, here you see, this sum of PI log of PI. So PI is the prevalence of, P1 is the prevalence of serotype 1, P2 for the serotype 2. So here is the Shannon index, and PI is the sum of the incidence of this, uh, uh, this from the primary infection and secondary infection, and here is the correlation from this uh, PI and the Shannon index, okay? The prevalence and the Shannon index. So what you see here from the picture, it is very clear that in some of the region here, the blue one is the total disease prevalence and H, red is the Shannon index. So like when it is very low, you see there is kind of increase in some of these cases here in the Shannon index. And that actually reflects in the cross correlation. Like in the same time point when there is lag zero, like 
this correlation is negative, so there's a negative impact. But in the lag of one and two years, there's a positive impact. But is, that is serotype diversity impact positive way to the total incidence of the disease. And that is what is seen very clear here uh, from this course correlation. So, uh, well, so you can give a, a kind of idea like AD can also give and this kind of model we can construct for the cities. Definitely we can uh, make this model more biologically realistic because it is not the AD for dengue to some extent cross, uh, sorry, uh, cross immunity also works to some extent. So we can also add this kind of thing and see like this real dengue pattern I mean, how much it depends on cross immunity as well as, well as ADE. Okay, so, well, so that is what I say. The ADE alone can produce the periodic and desynchronized oscillation on individual serotypes of dengue, and moreover, it can explain the correlation between serotype diversity and the total disease burden in the community. Now, this is the thing we see that the models of ADE or cross immunity can explain, I mean, not can explain, but these two mechanisms can show different type of dynamical pattern, okay? If we change the value, the strength of cross immunity or even this, uh, the strength of AD for these four pathogen. Now here in this, uh, we'll see next that how we can use this interaction mechanism to infer certain dynamical pattern. So here I'm going to talk about the story of whooping cough. Okay, we'll see that whooping cough has a very variable dynamics. We'll see in next few slides and here, we'll, uh, I, I'm going to show you in, this, uh, in the few slides that how we can use this to uh, explain this variable dynamics. So whooping cough is a bacterial disease, unlike dengue and uh, okay, influenza. They are all virus. It is a bacterial disease, and disease actually starts with cold-like symptoms, and within two weeks, severe coughing uh, 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 begins that continues for several weeks. And it sounds like a hoof kind of thing. That is why it names as whooping cough. And it, is a, it causes serious illness for child as children and as well as adult uh, individual, okay? So here is the snapshot of some of the whooping cough outbreak what is in different places. Uh, for example, what you see is the first one is the cases in the Copenhagen from 90 to 60 here, which is well, what you see in the time series is that intermittent bouts of large multi-annual dynamics with small periods in between, which is very clear from this, uh, the wavelet transformation, the lower panel is the wavelet transformation of this uh, uh, data here, and which shows very uh, dark and light region, and the light contour basically shows that stronger support for this three and four order period. So this is a weak scale, so it is around 120 week or something like that. So it's a three or four order period in these places here. Okay, and this kind of observation also see this erratic periodicity observed in England and Wales data and also uh, Denmark data and Canada data. So all over the data, what you see is that this exhibit erratic periodicity across space and time. And often there's a transition, as you see here, there's a transition from annual to biennial and triennial pattern in this hooping cup. And that is very uh, specific to hooping cup, okay? So again, this is, uh, several scientists has proposed several hypotheses to explain this thing. For example, noise in transmission, immunization, that is vaccination, and also demographics, that is birth rate due to uh, recurrent birth rate, high birth rate and kind of things that could happen, or this distributed latent on infectious period, okay, and immune boosting. But here we are proposing a different uh, hypothesis. We say that the, some of the observed dynamics, what we see in this data, could be explained as a consequence of interaction of this two strains of whooping cough. So these pertussis and parapartosis, I can tell you, these two strains can cause the same disease, whooping cough. And I'm saying that some of the observed uh, pattern in this last slide, what you saw, can be explained by interaction between them. And interaction, okay, well, so here is some of this uh, data of these parts and parapartosis. One is in Denmark from 1946 to 70, and another is Massachusetts. And here you will see here in the upper panel, the broken line is the parts and lower panel is the parapartosis. And here in the black 
outbreaks are the Pertussis one, and the red outbreak is for the Parapertussis. So what you see here that this, the, the, is the prevalence or whatever the incidence for this Parapertussis is much, much lower than Pertussis here. And both of them, which is very clear from these two data, that they exhibit out-of-phase oscillation. Okay, so both, you know, there's no peak, there's a peak kind of thing. So out of phase kind of thing here, completely out of phase oscillation. Okay, so we actually propose the interaction by these two uh, pathogen can give rise to this kind of pattern of hoping curve. And the interaction actually happens through, uh, uh, through convalescence or quarantine, like when individuals develop severe disease, they're taken from the chain of circulation. They're taken out from the hospital. They're taken to hospitals or uh, quarantine at home or something like happen. And that actually induces, induces certain kind of uh, interference for the other pathogen, okay? Which is fundamentally age structured. Why? Because this is kind of a documented study in the whooping cough uh, disease severity uh, outbreak here and if in, uh, in London from 1974 to 1975, what you see here, this hospital admission, this is also decreases with age, and also home cases, like who are quarantined at home, this is also decreases with age. So we assume that this isolation, this mechanism I'm talking about, this quarantine or isolation mechanism, it is fundamentally age structured, and that we have added in the model for more complexity. And we also assume that there's a high severity from the parts and low severity from the parapartosis. So this is the kind of ecological interaction that we proposed and we develop a model here. Here's the model schematic. So here is the susceptible, again, the group of individuals, and they can acquire infection from both of these diseases. They can acquire co-infection uh, by, uh, uh, by both of these pathogens. So they can move to a co-infection compartment. Over time, you see they can, uh, 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 like recover and they become susceptible for the other pathogen and they can recover and become immune for both of these pathogens. Now this is fine, but when some of the individuals develop severe disease, they're taken out from this, they're quarantined, they're taken out from this chain of circulation, right? So they are not exposed to the other pathogen, basically. So these two compartments here, CBP and C. BPP, these are the uh, two compartments where individuals are not exposed to the other pathogen. And this way, this introduces some interference with the other pathogen. So this is the model, and here is the model equation. As you understand, we uh, described this is fundamentally age structured. So this is the gamma is the parameter here that is uh, age structure uh, uh, convalescence working here. And what I see here with this, uh, with this model and with baseline values that model shows that stable out of phase oscillation between these two strains with interepidemic period four years and phase difference two years, what we have seen there. But what you see here is that two disease prevalence are same incidence, uh, but th not really true what you see there in the data, because data shows that who develop severe disease are reported. Parapartosis is less severe, so it is less reported in the hospital and clinics, okay, notified. And parts is more severe, so it is more reported. So that is why this will bring this disparity in this, uh, in this outbreak size, so which we have not considered here. Okay, so that we see. Now the more interesting thing happens when you see this basin of attractions. So what is basin of attractions? So basin of attractions is the set of initial conditions which leads to the system in certain dynamical behavior. So suppose this is your model. Let me describe here. So here is your susceptible is dot equal to this, I1 equal to this, I2, IP, P, sorry, I1 and I2, two disease here, okay? And here is say R1 and R2, so on. So what you see here the, by uh, this figure, what we want to see, if we take different initial condition for these two pathogen, Okay, for example, this is the initial condition of I1 and this is the initial condition of I2. 
Okay, if we suppose if we take the initial condition, a combination here in the star, this will tell you that where this long-term behavior is. Because whatever the model we are taking, or an initial value pro, uh, model, right? The solution depends on your initial conditions, okay? So here, for example, if we take initial condition from yellow, this will lead to the system, a attractor of this type. I hope you understood what, what's mean by this basin of attraction. So what you see here, that the four different attractors are uh, coexist in this nice intertwined basin of attraction. And this is the more complex attractor for this yellow one, this all time series what you see. And let me tell you another thing, is that the time series what you see here, this is the proportion of severe disease infected by either of the strain, either parthesis or parapartosis. And the, the, the severe, uh, the time series of the severe disease, not really the notification, okay. Okay, so the, that is what we see that for different initial condition, if we take, then it leads to different attractors. So four different attractors coexist. Okay, now what we actually saw in this data, we saw in the data that there is multi-annual dynamics, okay, often transition from annual dynamics in some time period, and then it is a binear or quadrilateral, or again multi-annual or something like that in the data. And what we see here is that different kind of attractors that could coexist here. So now if something we can do that our system is primarily say at t equal to zero is here, okay? And after that it will run for 10 years or something and something happens and you let system to jump on another point, okay? then system will go and uh, 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 stable in some other attractor, for example, blue. So it was here, this uh, dark blue, and next, it will, after 10 years, it will show the pattern of this kind. So this kind of different pattern it could show, if we can introduce some perturbation, or let the system happen to jump from one basic of, uh, uh, basin of attraction to another basin of attraction. Understood what I'm saying? So, so this is what you see in higher R0. In lower R0, it's same kind of more complicated basin of attraction. So three different attractors coexist. And all this type of different quarter attractor exist because of this interaction strength, the disease interaction. Okay? So you see that multiple coexisting attractors of different periods is an emergent property of this interacting system. Now I'll show that what kind of perturbation, the different way you can perturb a system, but in reality, differ, perturbation happens like because of environment, noise in transmission, and also one thing is that migration. So case importation, suppose we are in India, so some individual came or, uh, from outside with some disease and it spreads things here. Okay, case importation can part up the system and let the system uh, equilibrate to other attractors. So that is uh, what we have considered here. So this is the analytical representation of the case importation. So let me tell you uh, what is what does uh, the figure means basically. So the x-axis is the age class. So this model is age structured, right? Okay, so this is the age class that we are imported into the system. And this is the magnitude of the case importation. So we're only importing parthesis cases because this is very common. Parapartosis is less common compared to parthesis. So we are importing parthesis cases there. And what we see here is that when system stays in the baseline uh, uh, attractor here, for example, in this kind of pattern, suppose when there are a bunch of two-year-old migration come there in the system, of magnitude say 0.02, then system jump to in the light blue. That is this kind of attractor. And this not, the impact is not always same. For example, if you compare with six years old migrants, and they actually come and uh, migrate there at the same magnitude 0.02, system jump to yellow attractor of different, it shows different pattern here. So, what you see here, that simple disease interaction 
and perturbation like its importation can generate multi anode dynamics. Some period this shows a different pattern, again it jump because of chemical importation to some other uh, 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 attractor, something like that. Okay, that can describe this kind of uh, transition what you see in this hooping of data is that annual to biennial, triennial and different kind of pattern. Okay, but this is more kind of extreme case when all individuals of same age will migrate. Like here it is the consider is that all individual, if you are taking here, all two year age class for one time, all six year age class, this is more kind of unrealistic I would say. So what we considered is like distributed age class, like say one time we are getting a bunch of uh, migrants which are exponentially distributed, that is comprised of mostly infants here. Okay, and what you see here, we have four different attractors, one, two, three, four, and the arrow is, will tell you the, the point of time where this migration happens. And what you see here, this, this attractor now uh, shift to jump to this different kind of attractor. All are basically attractor four here, except this one. So the strength of migration and type determine where it will jump. So that is the perturbation happens. In uh, contrast, if we consider uh, like uh, a migrant which is mainly, mainly six years old or something, the elder age group, and you see that all four type of attractors will move to uh, jump to attractor two. So different kind of perturbation could happen. So what is the, the, the uh, then what we saw here is that the species interaction through convalescence, this process or this quarantine is called convalescence, okay, can explain this multi-annual complex time series of the hooping curve, which provide an additional hypothesis that why hooping curve shows different kind of erratic dynamics. And this is always true, oh, I mean, like uh, irrespective of uh, like space and time, like we have seen in the data from Canada, Denmark, and uh, Copenhagen. Okay, so now we saw that the, the mechanism process we can use to infer some of the pattern of the disease. The next thing will come now is that, okay, given a data, can we identify some of what kind of interaction is going on? Let's see, so here is what you see in this next uh, slides is that this is the data of uh, RSV and HPV. So what you see here, this gray region is a respiratory syncytial virus, this is a respiratory virus, okay, and uh, which uh, outbreaks annually from late fall through early spring. And we have three human para-influenza virus, which are very interactive. And as you see here, for example, HPV1 and HPV2, they have uh, outbreaks in every alternate year. For example, this red, blue, and green, and also HPM, uh, HMPV. But anyway, this three one, you see when there is a green, red one is here, green again, blue, and green. So red one is every two years, and red and blue basically alternate in age every year. So given this set of data, now the question is that, okay, what kind of interaction and do they at all interact? Is, is it possible that only seasonal forcing, because we have seen seasonal forcing can give rise to two year periodic data, right? So we may not need any interaction. So that is to determine kind of sort of inverse problem that how we identify this thing. So what we did here, okay, before that, one thing we should uh, notice here that RSV and HPV, they are actually member of the same family. They have the same ancestor here, which is the family is called the paramexavirus, but they exhibit out of phase outbreaks in the same host population, okay? So <clears throat> what we did here is, no, it's not working. Batteries. Okay, so here is we did the wavelet decomposition of the all four uh, SIME series, and what you see here that RSV shows consistent annual pattern here. These are in weeks, so nearly 52 weeks. Consistent pattern: HPV1 
two year band consistent pattern it means periodic is two years okay same is here hpiv2 but hpiv3 is more kind of ragged it uh, shows some significant spot around uh, annual uh, speak so this shows the periodicity over uh, time and uh, frequency domain and we also see how those passages this pair of strains do interact with the time and frequency domain so what we did is we compute the OLF coherence this is sort of advanced method of the, the cross correlation. Okay, so here we see here that HPV1 and HPV2 are strongly correlated with RSV in the 52 weeks band. This is the significant spot. There's some arrow, and that arrow will tell you who is leading whom. Here in both cases, this pair RSV HPV1 and RSV HPV2, both cases, the HPV uh, strain is leading RSV. They have their outbreak. Okay, and contrast, if you see this RSV and HPV3, so some significant spot here in 52 weeks band, and in this case, RSV is leading HPV3 uh, here. In this pair, HPV1 and 2, consistent band in this, uh, uh, in these two weeks, and this arrow shows they're completely out of phase, like what you see in this data. If you see this data is that this blue and red that consistent occurs in alternate year, okay? But this doesn't tell you that what kind of, this shows a preliminary evidence that, okay, some interaction is going on probably, this coherence, but doesn't tell you that what kind of interaction is going on. That is what we have to determine, okay? So we went to modeling approach here. Okay, that is what it tells. Now, so we developed several models for testing this, this cross immunity model, the same model, what I showed here, and also competition, that convalescence model, which is a bit modified here, okay? So, he, but here's the parameter theta, that determines the strength or uh, likelihood of the exposure uh, of this, uh, okay, this competition, okay? So, what we did with these models, that we have these cross immunity models, we have this competition models, and we have also no interaction models. So simple SIR models with birth and death, seasonal force, and we have three models in our hand. And what we'll do is, we are going to estimate some of the parameters and see that which model is going to explain this data, okay, the better or the best. Okay, so let's see here. So this some of the parameters we are estimating this alpha, this transmission rate, seasonal forcing, strength of interaction parameter for these two model. And along with that, we also compute the detection probability. Here probably I should tell you that what the data we have seen, these are not the actual new infections every week what you see, but they are the reported one. Not that every infection is reported in the clinics or hospital, okay? It depends. This is the thing where human behavior comes. Not everybody is going to go and report it. So we have to do some observational model for this, uh, 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 along with this process model. So model, what you see there, this two disease model, they're all process model. It's competition, cross immunity model, process model. Along with that, we have this observational model. And how it works, if TIT is the total number of newly infected in week T for pathogen I, that what we get from this process model, FI is the reporting probability, and that is the weekly case notification, is drawn from a Poisson distribution of mean AFI TIT. So this is the mean, and we take a Poisson distribution, we sample a number, and that is what we say, this is our weekly notification. And that is what we are going to feed to the data to determine all our, to, uh, the estimates of the parameters. Okay, so altogether we have three models and we have a couple of parameters to do this thing. And what you see here is, okay, fine. Along with this, we also do model selection. Now, parameter estimate you can do, but how can you determine this, uh, which model is doing better? So this is kind of the uh, statistical uh, uh, kind of methodology, which tell you this Akaik information criteria, sort of index that tell you is that which model is uh, doing best. And sort of thumb rule here is the lowest AIC is the most parsimonious, that's the best model to describe the data or explain the data. Okay, so, uh, well, see what it comes, so no interaction model, simple SIR model, seasonal force, seasonal mo uh, SIR model, and you are going to feed 
all these four sets of data, you see that it can explain the annual for, uh, pattern of RSV, but not really good for the HPIV2 and HPIV1, right? There are peaks here annually, but not really, the data are biennial, okay? So these two cases, it cannot explain. So SIR model, single SIR model, may not be the good one to explain the, the pattern here, okay? If we see the cross immunity model, that is very interesting. Let me uh, tell you that each panel is, uh, is showing the feet of these two disease cross model here. For example, strain one fitting this, and the same time strain two is fitting HPV. That is why we have three different combinations, okay? And you see that it can fit the annual pattern as well as biennial pattern of HPV1, okay? And same thing happening in this HPV2, and also annual pattern of HPV3, when they're fitting this annual pattern of RSV. So cross immunity is the technique, uh, the, the interaction mechanism which explains better than other. What you see in contrast, the competition is not doing well for HPV2 and HPV1 when it can describe the RSV very well. So competition cannot also describe this thing very well. So it is the cross immunity that explains this uh, pattern. And uh, okay, AIC analysis, you see this also reflected in this uh, AIC index. This is the lowest among uh, all other, this single SIR model and competition. So we can determine this is the cross immunity model. Okay, fine. But now we also did likelihood surface. So what is likelihood surface? So it describes how likely your parameter combination. So now we determine this, uh, okay, your cross immunity model can describe, but how about if you change your parameter? So here is the likelihood surface describe this thing. For example, here you see in each of this combination, there are white mark here. This white mark shows that this is the best fit what you get from this model fitting, okay? And the blue region around this, okay, maybe the better. And once you go far from there, it's not really going uh, do this uh, do better to fit this model, this combination. For example, here if you go to this red, this combination that 0 0.4 and 0 0.8 for these two cross immunity cannot explain this RHBA by two dynamics. So that is what likelihood surface is. We can understand that how these two parameters are correlated in explaining the data, uh, the data set, given data set. So it's very useful technique to understand this, uh, the influence of the parameter on this data. Okay, fine. The interesting thing is that when you plot this all parameter values, across spectrum, what you see here, that strength of RSV on HPIV actually uh, decreases if we move from HPIV1 to HPIV2. And this sort of thing reflects, and biologically, what you see here, this is the family tree of the mixed virus family, and the, uh, uh, what is that, this uh, arrows here, the black is the RSV, red is the HPIV1, green is the HPIV3, and blue is the HPIV2. So more distant is the strain has less cross immunity, that is what it shows. So this kind of uh, result reflects sort of linking between biological fact and mathematical, uh, you know, uh, or biological observation and mathematical fact or computational fact. So this generates very interesting uh, science. So, uh, yeah, the strength of cross protection are inversely proportional to the genetic distance. So in summary, so what you see here, the seasonality is necessary to explain the internal variation. For example, how, you know, the outbreak will be there persist for this seasonal variation is very, very important. But this cross protection immunity is essential for explaining the interannual, like their interepidemic period and serotype uh, dominancy will be decided by the cross protection immunity or cross immunity. So uh, this is maximum likelihood approach and model selection is a very useful technique. Some of the ma'am also explained that thing to understand the data and uh, you know how model really explains in data. And this kind of work is very useful uh, to uh, you know design vaccination strategy, etc. So, oh sorry, the conclusion I forgot to write. 
So I can tell you what is the conclusion of this thing. So conclusion is that we understand that disease interaction is kind of an evident phenomena, obvious phenomena, when more than one strain co-circulates in the community. And so, so public health officers and also disease uh, epidemiologists should consider, might take into account uh, into this uh, study when they uh, implement some public health policies like introducing vaccination or, uh, you know, uh, when some outbreak happens, they introduce school closure and kind of thing. They might take into account this thing. And second thing is very important, like data collection, the surveillance methodology. We should improve our surveillance methodology and data collection process so that we can get, you know, data for different strains, different disease in the, what, the same time period so that I can understand how those different disease interact with each other and what's the impact on the other thing. That is useful to infer or design some uh, uh, control measure or control policy. Okay, so here I'll uh, stop and I'll thank, uh, because this is the places I was there and learned several techniques uh, or understanding about the disease. Here is my disease modeling lab next to you. So we have, good, this is a good time. And uh, my students is there and these are my collaborators and uh, Okay, thank you, all of you, for your attention. And another thing probably I should tell you is that we are taking up students, uh, like uh, 3rd June is the last date for, uh, uh, for application of the PhD, and our department as a uh, faculty for working different areas, pure mathematics and different, you know, uh, field in uh, computational biology, fluid dynamics and image analysis, and also mathematical biology, immunology, and uh, uh, partial differential equation, no complex network, game theory. So if uh, you can circulate and, you know, let your friends and things good. So we have a good amount of stipend, 35,000 per month. We have hostels. And this is a good campus. You can see this nice picture it is indeed. Okay? So thank you very much. Uh -huh. so, uh, so uh, have you checked the correlation between the disease uh, quantitatively and the genetical disease what you were trying to mention? Uh, well, not really. So what, if, what we got here is that the strength of interaction parameter, okay, by fitting to the data. But uh, there is a definite way to measure this genetic distance. That we did, didn't do it. But from the phylogenetic tree, we can see that, OK, this, this, this two strain are kind of uh, has distance larger compared to other. So it is not the actual distance. It's the qualitative comparison. OK, here are the two pathogens, and another one is lying here. So definitely, these two are kind of the distance one compared to these two pairs and what is the effect of. So this comparison is qualitative. This is a comparison, not really quantitative. But this shows some kind of quality. This is a po you, you, you don't do uh, correlation function and Fourier transformation of this? No, it is possible. I'm not saying it is not possible. It's possible, but we didn't do in that paper. Um, but qualitatively, it shows that it match this thing, like close uh, uh, strains shows more strength of uh, immunity, where the distant one shows kind of less interaction, the protection. That's what. Right.